from her. We'll then go over the program structure and the two uh, options that that's delivered in. We'll move into our uh, panelist discussion. So you'll hear from one of our current students and past alumni and some of the great outcomes that they got from the masters and then open the floor up to your audience Q&A. So at any time throughout the session, please ask any questions in the chat. Uh, when the floor is opened up to you, uh, raise your hand as well so we can um, see that you want to ask a question and we'll come to you. So thank you, Francis, for joining us tonight. I welcome you to the floor. Um, and introduce yourself and why Tech Futures Lab. <laughs> Good, I thank you, Amanda. It's uh, great to see you all here tonight. So thank you for the introduction and the karakia. Um, now, also, I see some wonderful familiar faces. So thank you for Alum and, and for um, Brady, the current student, for joining us tonight. I know that a lot of you will still be in full lockdown like we are here in Auckland. And as much as we look like we're sitting in our offices, and certainly Maheshi and I look like we're in the office, just to reassure you we're not. <laughs> it is our virtual background. Uh, and then we are tucked away at home. Um, I will just jump straight into a presentation about the things that we think about within Tech Futures Lab and why it's really important that we have a program in New Zealand that really is future focused and thinking about the impact on all of us as uh, professionals in our uh, respective fields and what that means for the future. So. Please just one moment while I share. Now, um, and I think just a quick reminder, if you're on the call, if you wouldn't mind just putting yourself on mute, just a little bit of background um, there, so that'd be fantastic. So first of all, I think most of you will be aware we're based in um, Grafton in the corner of Kyber Pass Road and Nugent Street. But we are a, a virtual institute as well, and a lot of our uh, programs are delivered online. But this is our building, um, as it probably looks right now, as it's evening as we are here in Auckland. But I just want to talk mostly in the session that I have in the time about the things that we focus on within the program. Because while the, the actual name of the program is Technological Futures, we really do see that as almost the hygiene part. You know, we are moving into an era and an age of digitization and actually the technological part of it is that every role we're in, regardless of the field and expertise that we hold, has digitized. And so we have to think about that as the backdrop and then think about the, the overlay of the levers of change that we're facing. So just to go through a few of them here and the issues and the topics and the, the debates that are held, some of these um, are key areas. So first of all, inequality. Now, inequality has become almost the, the calling card of uh, the modern era with consumption and the way we looked at capitalism. We've actually um, unfortunately ended up in a situation where the world is divided between those who have access to the likes of education, health, housing, and those who are not. And it's something here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we have to be incredibly mindful of that we don't have equal playing field for all. And how do we address that? given our market is changing, our demographics are changing, and our responsibility for each other in our communities that we serve. Um, the environmental impact, I don't think there's anybody on this call that would be a climate denier in the effect that we're having around the world as the world heats up. And we're seeing that every day playing out across the globe between extreme floods, as we saw here in West Auckland in the last few days, through to the extreme forest and bushfires around the world. And so how is it going to affect us? How do we need to think about everything from logistics and packaging, um, the way that people will consume products, rebuy products, how do you engage with your customers? How do you travel to them and how do they travel to you? There's so many implications around impact with environment and sustainability, which have to come into, into frame for everybody who is in any form of strategic role or a role where you're trying to make a social uh, impact. We also have an aging population. Um, this is one that people don't necessarily see because if you look out in the community, it's not something that's really immediately apparent. But actually the reality is the number of people who will live 30 years past retirement is increasing dramatically every year. And so most people on this call should expect to live to be closer to the 100 than to 70, uh, with the majority of people living well over, well over 90. We have a generation of Zoomers or Generation Z, 
And Gen Z are the largest population grouping on the planet. There are 2.8 billion young people up to the age of around 25. And they have never known the world without the internet, without connectivity, without a smartphone. They see the world play out in real time and they are far more informed. And unfortunately, if you've got children in this age group, they're also smarter than all of us because they've actually had um, democratized access to information. And so that meant that they didn't have to rely on access to a, an individual or an encyclopedia or a good teacher to know what's going on in the world. They just needed an internet connection. We're imagining economic reinvention. We're looking at some of these other models around capitalism, the circular economy, thinking about how we get social capital into the market, the triple bottom line, um, and also just thinking about new currency frameworks. And some of that is around cryptocurrencies, digital currencies, non-fungible tokens. We're seeing all sorts of changes around payment system and the rise of fintech. Uh, infrastructure is a, is a burden for every major city in the world and every new city that they're building to um, accommodate the, raising, the rising population. And so redundancy and in infrastructure, people invest and put capital into building systems and infrastructure and roads and water systems and housing that then becomes redundant pretty quickly as we get replaced with better information, new systems and different needs. And so what do we do if that capital is there and it's no longer fit for purpose and yet there isn't the investment available to actually make systems uh, more future-proofed. The cyber-physical world is the world that is, again, not very visible, but the idea that there are now ways of thinking about the convergence between the real and cyber. And some of these are like digital twins, which is basically a, a, a sort of a virtual twin of systems, like it could be infrastructure systems, it could be building systems, it could be people in place. Um, we have more human augmentation than ever before, before, and also we are starting to augment ourselves in just very simple ways, things like wearables and watches and health, um, uh, you know, wearables that we're wearing to find out more about how our bodies are functioning. One of the biggest challenges that the OECD has uh, said in, in the world right now is the need for adults to be educated. And if you're making decisions based upon old knowledge, then actually it's a real risk for the organization that you're, you're working within. But also if you're running your own organization or you plan to start one, if you don't have the latest information, you can be making some very costly long-term mistakes. So how do we make sure that people stay learning that, real, that sort of real-time contemporary knowledge that we all need um, more than ever? The technology that we are facing is... Brenda, just need to have great web socks. Great web socks. We don't... We don't oh, just a moment. Can somebody just put their, their phone on mute? Thank you. Lovely. Um, the technologies that we're facing are, are, are significant. And most of these technologies here between AI, machine learning, quantum, et cetera, you, you will be very familiar with by name, maybe not so much by how the application works. And within Tech Futures, we, we really delve into these areas and make, let people understand how the application could affect them and people could be affected in their roles or within the organizations. And then some of the um, ethical dilemmas that we face of things like the dominance of tech giants, their influence on our lives, uh, we, we think about things like Google and wonder how much information that Google hold on us or how much does Amazon or Apple or any of the others or Facebook hold on us and how does it influence what we see and what we buy and who we meet and who uh, informs us. So these are big, um, significant change levers and we are always thinking about these through a day-to-day -day context and looking well into the future through tech futures. I just wanted to just to kind of put some visuals to some of these technologies for some that may not be so familiar. So here's some examples here of digital humans developed by Soul Machines here in Auckland. And the idea that you can have very human looking interfaces that are actually based upon uh, an AI and algorithm that develops them. So if you can even just see on this one here, so this is not a real person, but actually is based around an algorithm and you could choose what your digital human might look like in the interface. So this could be your virtual booking agent. This could be somebody who represents you with your brand. It could be someone who has a help desk or a health line. Uh, it could be someone in mental health or social development. But this is an idea where we're starting to look at um, new ways of thinking about communications. And again, this is a fabulous technology built right here and you know, within kilometers of where we sit. Um, robots. Uh, we haven't seen a huge adoption of robots within um, New Zealand because we don't have such many large industries and we, we also have had a reasonable supply of 
of people. Um, and what's changed more recently with COVID is obviously we have a massive talent shortage and there's been huge investment in recent months around fruit picking and packing and logistics around robotics and the first of dark warehousing is starting to appear in New Zealand as well. And dark warehousing is basically warehouses that don't need to turn the lights on because all of the automation and robotics that work within the system uh, operate without humans on site. So we do have to think about what are our roles as, as humans and what we can do in the future as robots and, and automation uh, can take away some of the, the more manual jobs. And this is not in terms of scaremongering and thinking about it in a negative light, but actually thinking about productivity um, and what we could be doing to make the world a better place, but also making sure that as humans, we are giving people the chance to use the most powerful weapon of all, which is our minds to do good things. And so that we're not caught up in, in highly um, repetitive tasks. Climate change, the visuals are, are all pretty intimidating, but again, we need to be reminded in our our youth and our children and, and certainly if you have children and my own children are very focused on this and see this has been one of the major issues of their life. Humanoids, uh, the move between the, the humans, the digital humans we saw in the first image through to the combination of humans with robots. So advances that have been made here. This is Sophia um, and she, when she has a wig on and, and uh, she is actually very believable in terms of her movement and expression. So. I actually got to share a stage with her in Australia a few years ago, and she is extraordinarily convincing when you get talking to her. Population growth. Uh, the population when I was young hit three and a half million, sorry, three and a half billion people. I thought that was a pretty big number. We're nearly at eight billion, and the world will continue to expand um, all things on, assuming everything continues as, as planned right now for until around 2050, when the population is expected to sort of stagnate around 10 billion people. So a huge amount of people um, gathering, particularly in large cities. So we've now got these mega cities forming of you know, sometimes 10 to 20 million people in a single city. And so this is a big uh, challenge for us as we think about the distribution of resources. Data and the collection of it from everything from the Internet of Things through to uh, our Bluetooth connections to the way we actually move around the planet and the things we do, that data has been collected all the time and what we do with it. And every given year now, there is more data collected this year in 2021 than all previous data and that was ever created by humans up until last year. And the same thing will happen again next year. We have just got this huge appetite for creating data and uh, using, utilizing it in a way that can actually better inform where we're going. Cyborgs is part of the sort of metaphysical or cyber-physical worlds and people looking at augmentation. Um, augmented reality and, and the advances there, particularly around things like construction and health and safety and getting people to really understand uh, the risks without having to put themselves into risky situations. It all started for many of you, you probably remember with Pokemon Go, Go when suddenly overnight your children or maybe even yourself, you downloaded the Pokemon app and off you went to, to gather Pikachus out in the neighbourhood. Uh, virtual reality and the experiences where we are immersing ourselves into new environments and how that might look for tourism, for experiences, for actually learning and education, and so how that might impact on some of those experiential type industries. And then, of course, the Google of knowledge and the likes with our children and many of you yourself will be you know, Mr. Du Mr. Google or Dr. Google or teacher YouTube. Uh, there are many examples where we're shifting our understanding of where knowledge comes from and what we do with it. Machine learning is a subset of uh, artificial intelligence and also this idea of predictive analytics. So if you are a, a really um, clever retailer, you would be building in machine learning algorithms so that you can predict the types of items that may be purchased in the coming days and weeks before your customers even buy them. Or you'd be able to inform a customer of the types of things that they would like to buy so they're making very personalized uh, buying decisions. There are reports all over the world at the moment, this is one of the most interesting, it comes out every year, which is the Edelman Trust Barometer about trust, and it looks around the world at what people are concerned about. Certainly the pandemic has uh, changed the entire the way we look into the future. We have digitised uh, around eight years faster than we expected, and in most markets, digitisation, e-commerce rise, the, uh, the number of people who have moved onto the internet and actually into the digital world has 
never been higher. In fact, it's an exponential curve from pre-pandemic days. And so that's been a, a huge change. Uh, these great men, or not, uh, don't need much of an introduction, but actually we are having a crisis of leadership around the world and what it means and the types of decisions and who makes them. And so this is playing out as well in something that politics gets talked about frequently at Tech Futures in a very open and transparent and non-judgmental way because it's an important conversation to have. Uh, in this uh, report, this Edelman Trust one, I think it's interesting, this report has literally just come out and these are the priorities around the world and where there's been the biggest shift. So these are the pro So then net 62 is that 70% of people think it's more important that we need to improve our healthcare system and only 8% think it's less important. And so these are the top um, areas in the world right now, according to this trust barometer, which is actually across say, thousands, tens of thousands of people in hundreds of countries. So poverty, so it's in their particular country, education, climate, uh, combating fake news, individual freedoms, economic and social divide, and discrimination and racism. So you'll see a lot of these as actually societal and humanitarian type crises or things that are about community. So you're not seeing there necessarily uh, the issues as much around technological advances because they have almost now been accepted and they were much more prominent in, the, in uh, previous barometers in years gone by. Now we've had this real shift, I think a lot to do with COVID about actually our communities, their safety, their ability to thrive, and actually the people who we work with, our, our families, our whanau, and making sure that, that people do have this ability individually and collectively to, to be the best they possibly can. So um, I just want to just uh, call out a couple of issues that we have uh, specifically within New Zealand, which I think are so important to identify. So we are part of, of a small advanced economies around the world, the likes of um, Finland and Sweden and Singapore and Israel and Ireland and many others where the population is uh, reasonably small, we have a high, reasonably high GDP, but actually in New Zealand we have a few things which uh, we're an outlier. We are the lowest in the innovation rankings of the small advanced economies. We have the lowest productivity rate and an example here with economic complexity ratings, you'll see this black line, which is economic complexity is actually the sophistication of our country's exports and how easy is it for other markets to copy or be copycats of what we do as opposed to being distinctively um, from Aotearoa New Zealand. And you'll see here, we have lost that complexity, uh, which also aligns with our decline in innovation. And so a lot of the stuff we're doing now, other markets could do very well, and that's possibly uh, and probably because we haven't really advanced enough with the technological advances that are available to us, but also not enough focus on research and development. And that has been a long-term issue for New Zealand. We have very low levels of R&D uh, for markets that are comparable. Uh, I just mentioned very quickly about productivity, the, the red line being New Zealand. Um, our productivity actually peaked in the 1970s where we were doing some pretty remarkable things. And if people were around in those days, there were a lot of things around um, things like jet propulsion and, and motoring. And we had some really interesting things around farming and some, and some innovations that were really driving productivity. Um, but actually since then, it hasn't really uh, increased. In fact, you can see it's declined. And the productivity, the productivity Commission in New Zealand really calls us out about um, our lack of adoption of, of the right tools of the time is going to hold us back. So Tech Futures, we really look at saying there are a lot of tools that are available at very little or low, uh, low cost or free that actually could turn the productivity of an organization around, but it does take awareness of what those might be and how they could be implemented. So basically, I just want to very quickly uh, look at this, uh, the, the Voris Future Cone of what things are looking like into the future. So many people uh, assume that next year is going to look like this year, but we're going to make more money and have less cost. Uh, that is just not the reality that actually there is a number of ways you can think about the future. And uh, the one at the bottom projected business as usual continuation of the past, we know is not going to happen again. We've got too many uh, contributing factors from the exponential rise in processing capacity of machinery and, and technology and processes of computers the advances of the technologies I've already talked about. We also know things have had to change because of population and, and the economic and societal shifts that we've had. 
but also we are having increasing numbers of what we call black swan events, such as COVID, which actually changed things quite significantly. And so we have to think about the future in a very different way. And so as we go through uh, the probability of different types of scenarios with Intech Futures, it, it really brings it back to how do we make sure we maximize opportunities in a good way so that actually our impact and our improvements that we can make into the world, but also our communities that we serve or the businesses we look after are actually informed and actually beneficial as opposed to detrimental. Um, right. I'm just going to go through just a final um, slide here around uh, why do people not adopt change? Now, I won't go in too much detail here, but actually what we see uh, for a lot of organizations when they first come in, the students will come in from places and talk about these barriers that they're experiencing in their workplaces. And some of these will be familiar with you, things like uh, the complacency that actually that a business has had really good success before and so they kind of keep going with what they're doing and just blind to what's going on around them and so often it's a, a siloed effect where they're not looking beyond their sector or their competitors and not looking at the fringes or the margins where other activity is emerging and disruptors are kind of coming into their space speed you know a lot of people think i'll just catch up when i can you know, I'll keep working for a few more years, I'll stay in my job, and then I might go and do some study, or I might go and do a bit of learning, or I might change the strategy at that point. Actually, you need to stay with it. It is a bit of a conveyor belt process. You stay on and stay informed and stay connected. Actually, is much easier than trying to catch up, both as an individual and as a business. Um, there's also structure. There's a lot of still of the command and control type organizations where all decisions are made at the top. People at the top are the least likely to be um, informed with new practices and new opportunities and the latest science and, and actually uh, the research that informs. So if you're only having decisions made at the top and you're not seeing it from people across the organization, including youth and people with different backgrounds and diversity, you're actually missing out on a massive opportunity to improve. And then sometimes you literally just have a group think mentality. If you have a company built around, you know, 40 engineers and 40 engineers keep hanging out and, and lunchroom together, they will reinforce the same view. It's the same way as algorithms. If you are following certain um, groups or interests on Facebook, you will suddenly see a lot more of that and it will reinforce your view when you're on Google and you'll start to actually believe that everybody thinks the same way that you do. It's really important in today's world. We break the, the chain of you know, going down the same rabbit holes and reinforcing what we think is true and actually understanding the world is full of diverse thoughts and all sorts of people doing things quite differently. So I'm, I'm going to leave the uh, formal presentation here. Um, and, and now we can open up the floor to any questions to the audience to ask Francis or you're most welcome to pop those in the chat. No wrong questions here, so just jump in. It's always hard when somebody is <laughs> breaks the ice with the first question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if while we're waiting for any questions that might come through, I just um, uh, sorry. Um, I was going to ask if that's okay. Yeah, um, sure. yeah. How how I, I was recommending this course in terms of it being quite practical relative to some other masters um, degrees that there are out there. Are you able to just maybe talk a bit about um, what makes this more practical and you know, what, what aspects of it are different to, um, you know, for example, a master's in innovation and entrepreneurship or, or those kind of um, courses? Sure, Lisa, and thanks for the question. Um, look, first of all, you'll get a lot of those answers directly from our students and graduates, which will be really useful. From my point of view, as, as a developer and founder of the organization, um, for me, having a thesis that is never going to be applied after spending many months of work and research really felt disconnected from what people, as mature adults, now our students on average, just to give you an idea, and they're actually 40, somewhere between 40 and 45. Um, but actually we do have a really wide range. So these, we talk about mature students for the most part. And so most people have some form of a plan they want to implement in their life, whether it be a business plan for their company or whether they're starting to think about an impact project that they want within their community, or they're actually wanting to start their own business. And actually that time you're spending should be absolutely applicable to what you want to do. It should never be removed and put onto the shelf. And so 
all of our contributors are experts in their field. So you don't have just one or two faculty who teach you the whole way through. Uh, you literally have a different faculty member and expert for every session that you're involved with. So you have inputs from experts who then become part of your own network and you can reach out and connect with them as well. So it's, it's about the application and the connection to a, to a contemporary world using industry practitioners. So while our, our staff and faculty are highly qualified, they don't think of themselves as academics. So it's, it's really breaking away from that particular mold. And, and it, it is, again, it's not that many, we are the only uh, private graduate school in the country. And it's very deliberate that we're focusing on the future state. So today and into the future for all of our top, for all the subjects that we teach, as opposed to subjects we are you know, focusing on in areas which are very much looked after by the traditional universities. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that does. Thank you. Great. Has anyone else got a question before we might just hand over um, back to Amanda to, to start the panel? Because I know we always run out of time for these panels. There's always so yes. many great questions. Um, I have a question in the chat from Arif who was asked, um, what, do you, what can you talk to about cybersecurity with a recent transit agency in Montreal having a, a ransom attack on them? Um, and where do you see that? How's can I, can I elaborate the question a little bit more? Yeah, sure. I, I recently finished my PhD uh, in, from AUT and working on um, the NWSV. And recently we're working on uh, Montreal and one of the bus has been hacked. The bus cost is like one and a half million, but you know, the hacking hacker uh, demand rents, asked for rent on like 2.7 million. So the university, you know, like Auckland, New Zealand has a really good plan to bring it 100% electric by 2030. So I imagine that how the, how the things are gonna change like when everything becomes electric, especially the government fleets becoming electric, the buses becoming electric, ferries becoming electric, aeroplanes becoming electric. What, how can we resolve the, you know, the cybersecurity problem? Arif, look, it's a good question, but I, I, I don't have the same fear. We've had, I mean, there's electric and then there's electric connected to the internet. So I think you're talking about ones that are connected through a, a, a 5G or an IoT connection, because obviously we've had electric uh, transportation even 100 years ago. So I think if you're talking about those that are connected, then actually there has been now, you know, thousands, planes have been flying around for an extremely long time, which are connected in, with Wi-Fi. And we've also got electric cars on Wi-Fi. I mean, I myself drive a Tesla and there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of Teslas around the world that don't, ha you know, don't have hacks, but they are updating their software constantly. There are firmware and software updates. I have one every couple of days in my car, which is actually always looking and being one step ahead. There is a risk. There is no question. There is the same risk in any form of access to the internet, the same way that we can have uh, our, our own privacy hacked. It comes down to technologies and people in cyber really being on top of that. And you know, in New Zealand, we have CERT, which is the Cyber Enforcement Agency for the government, and who monitor what happens. And we have to be very uh, aware that there's also, there's, a, there's sort of a, a positive counterattack against cyber. You know, there is, it's, yes, there are people who will go out and target. Yes, there are risks that actually somebody could hack into uh, anything from a power station through to an individual car. But actually, there is just as many people, if not more, who are focused on protecting in the same way that we protect our buildings and we protect uh, any form of health and safety. So I think we have to be a little bit cautious that we don't see necessarily the media concerns. And we, we obviously had a big breach at Waikato Hospital recently, which was really significant. And it's been a real wake up call across government agencies and companies and, and companies and boards that I'm involved in have all like, had to really delve deep into their cyber policies to make sure that they are actually looking and leave, uh, living and breathing the needs that they have. But this is the world we live in. We are moving increasingly into connected environments. There is, you know, whether they be physical environments, people environments, or actually plant and machinery and mobility devices. And so uh, even, even within that space, we have things like quantum computing, which is going to challenge us again, because they will be able to uh, basically penetrate through any type of password system. So you've got people who are doing counter intelligence against that. But I do think one of the things in Tech Futures, I'm, I'm an absolute optimist. There is, the world 
is it a better place than it has been for, in, for most people? There are more educated people. There are more people who live on, who with that, with, you know, move themselves out of poverty and lifted themselves into, uh, into a better life, more education. There is better food, better quality. There are more jobs and opportunity. There's a democratization of the education system. There are many good things, but I think often we do get caught up on some of the negative things which feel very prominent in our lives because media cover them um, because a clickbait works really well. So I'm not saying this is clickbait here, but I'm just saying that this is part of the world that we live in. Thank you, Francis. We have a great question from Calvin in the chat. Where do you see the biggest opportunities for New Zealand to close that innovation and productivity gap? And do you feel our handling of COVID with minimal economy impact could propel New Zealand tech further? It's a great question, one I love, because I, I'm a huge believer that New Zealand has repositioned itself away from primary industries as a, as a country of trust. And you know, we were seen to be compliant, we were seen to be responsive, uh, we had a, a, you know, a very much a high level of awareness around the world by our approach to COVID. If you think about the technologies of it today, whether it be thinking about where you st store your data, or where your algorithms are written, or who writes your algorithms, or where you think about cybersecurity or health data or education, all of them require trust. You know, where would you send your children to go to school if they wanted to go offshore? New Zealand sounds like a pretty good place. Who do you want to write your algorithms that are going to determine who gets an insurance policy? It's automated. I want someone who, who has got equal, you know, who's got the quality and fairness and non-biased uh, influences. In the same way, you wouldn't want necessarily a big tech company to necessarily have control of, of an insurance policy. So I think we've got, we're in a time right now as we move into the cyber physical and into, into data-based digital systems, uh, our credibility as a nation that can be trusted. And actually I think from a cultural point of view, but also from a, a differentiating ourselves from other markets, it could be our future calling card of something that we're not going to be the biggest, we're not going to be the cheapest, but actually, you come to New Zealand as a tourist and you'll get an authentic, credible experience and you won't be put on a bus full of people and, and moved around the city and, and flown back to the airport. I think we could build an industry around trust and actually credibility, but it will take a lot of time and, and really big thinking people right now to understand those opportunities because that window will close as the world comes fully back online over coming months and years. So it's really ours for the taking right now. And I'm, I'm a great believer that trust will be our calling card for quite some time to come. Thanks, Francis. Are there any other questions from the audience? Most welcome. We can always come back to uh, the questions that are here and any other questions that come through with, with the panel, we can come back to you tomorrow. If we've got your details, then we can certainly come back and answer those questions in more detail. Yes. Great, well, I'll hand over to, to, is it to Maheshi? Back, back over to me and I will just reshare my screen. Thank you so much, Francis. It was very insightful. One moment while I reshare my screen. Great, so I'll just go through um, the program structure um, and the two options that we have. So we've got uh, the part-time and full-time options that the Master of uh, Technological Futures is delivered in and um, an on-site version and a blended version as well. So our October intake will be on-site. You can choose to have that part-time 75 weeks over a year and a half or full-time over a year. That first immersion phase is the same for both options. So that's 20 weeks. And this is where you'll learn about these emerging disruptive technologies and engage in our industry advisors and your classmates to flesh out the um, problems or challenges or the opportunities that these technologies could bring in, in this contemporary world that we live in. And then in the applied learning phase, this is where you'll you'll spend that immersion phase having explored these, these technologies and um, 
deciding on your problem statement, your research problem area that you want to flesh out further and being aligned with uh, the appropriate industry advisor, as we have a number of them that will have their own subject matter um, matters that they're, they're an expert in, you'll work on researching these topics further and developing that project plan um, and a real world solution that you can come out of the program with. So our next intake starts on the 13th of oh, sorry, 28th of October with applications closing on the 13th and I've provided um, handbooks for the 2021 and 2022 uh, intakes as well. You'll, I'll provide these details after the session as well so you'll have access to those too. So I'd like to introduce you to our team, firstly to um, our program lead Maheshi. So she oversees um, the running of the program and um, the academic rigour of the program too, as well as interviewing um, yourselves as potential candidates to make sure that the program is a good fit for you and um, your goals and aspirations in your future. So Maheshi, I will now hand over to you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, kia ora, everybody. Um, as Amanda said, my name is Maheshi. Um, so I absolutely adore and love the Masters of Technological Futures program, and it is our flagship program that we are so incredibly proud of. Um, we also have two supporting postgraduate certificates, um, the Human Potential for the Digital Economy and the Connected Environments program, which I know some of you are on, on this call are currently in one of the cohorts. So it's great to see you join the call as well um, as you're thinking about the pathways into the masters as well. And we can um, discuss that uh, a little bit later on. Um, so I oversee the three programs offered um, under the um, Tech Futures Lab um, brand. And then this program is supported by Paula Gare, who's our lead advisor. So Paula is um, alumni as well. She was in cohort one. Um, and um, as, as some of you might be aware, um, you get paired off with a industry advisor um, that will um, you know, see you through the master's journey and be your biggest champion, um, help you with you know, any pivots that come your way and provide that one-to-one -one support. Um, but you do have access to this incredible panel of advisors as well. And Paula is um, managing that team of advisors. Um, and then we have our amazing Yuka Gray, who is our program manager, focused on um, the operational sides of the program. And so, and then she's supported by Sarah Mwashwama, who is our program coordinator, um, who implements some of those, you know, coordination tasks. So as a team, um, it's, a, a, it's a strong team of support to you as candidates if you decide to pursue the masters. So I think Amanda, we're gonna um, move on to introducing the panelists now. If you flick onto the next slide. I'd like to introduce our panelists for this evening, um, Bradley Walker, who is currently um, in Gen 13. So our programs, our cohorts are named according to generations. Um, so the October intake coming up is um, Gen 16. So we're up to the 16th intake. So I think Francis, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the program is, has been running to close to five years now. Correct. Yeah, that's yes. Right. Yeah, um, and so Bradley is a current student in their project phase of the Masters. And then we're also joined by Linda Sturgis and Melissa Crawford, who are alumni, who are both from Gen 8. So welcome, Bradley, Linda and Melissa. Thank you. Oh, so if you stop sharing your screen, Amanda, so we can see everyone's faces. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, we have a list of questions that um, I'll ask the panelists. Um, but as Amanda has always said, you know, if you have any other questions and I see a question about uh, pathways into a PhD and I can touch on that as well, um, please put it in the Slack and I'll keep note of that as well. So um, just to kick off as a way of introduction, um, are you able to um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you were doing as a job when you enrolled the master's program? And we might start with you, Bradley. Yeah, kia ora tato. Um, I currently work uh, in my own business called Adrenaline Group um, and also have that with my wife's business called Mother Recruitment. So Adrenaline Group uh, screen creators um, of TV programs, videos, uh, games and animation. 
um, my wife's company, Mana Recruitment, a specialist Mana uh, Recruitment Agency in Māori and Pacific space. So that's what I came into the Masters with in terms of a background. Fantastic, thank you. Linda, we might go to you next. Sure. Um, so I was um, a started off as a senior partner private banking, um, leading a team of six to ten private bankers that managed the personal financial affairs of some of our country's most wealthy individuals and family offices. Um, I was sort of looking for a um, change in my career. I'd got to a point where I'd um, I've been in the industry for 32 years and um, was felt like I was a little bit painted into a corner. So I'll leave it. And thank you, Linda. And Melissa, you wanted to go next. First of all, a big draw card coming today was any opportunity to hear Francis talk again. I'll come back any time to hear you, Francis. Um, Easy, Melissa. <laughs> so um, I originally had an IT background and then I had pivoted and I'd spent a lot of time in the kind of people and culture space, um, really um, drilling into kind of people and organisational psychologies and behaviours. And I really wanted to, I felt like I was losing my tech roots, which I was very passionate about. And I saw this really interesting um, just like when I first did my IT degree and we were going from paper to technology and people were terrified that that was going to take over people's jobs. And I'd played a bit of a, a role during that time around the um, hybrid between understanding how to talk techie but understanding how to talk human. Um, and I saw the, the similar opportunity where I was saw that same sort of um, tornado storm of AI is going to take our jobs, robotics is going to take our jobs, etc. And I really wanted to make sure that I upskilled myself in that tech space again. And my um, dream was to really cross those two so that I would work across people and technology and how to optimize the best of both. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all your introductions. Um, and the next question that I have here is, and I think this is something that has been already been asked uh, uh, to, uh, to Francis as well, um, just about, you know, why did you choose the Masters of Technological Futures over the other program offerings um, available in more traditional institutions? Who wants to go first? Linda, do you want to go first? I'm happy to, yeah. Um, so um, at this point in my career, and as I said, I felt painted into a corner. I, I needed to, I felt I needed a heavy hitting academic qualification. Um, and if for no other reason than my own personal confidence, just to have that um, qualification. Um, and I'd done a lot of investigation about the MBA program, and I'd actually discussed it with my leader at the time. And she knew Frances and heard about her work. And she pointed me in this direction. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, this was um, just so much more forward looking than any of the MBA programs I looked at. And I particularly loved the structure of the immersion phase followed by the part time and really fitted lifestyle. Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. Melissa or Bradley, do you want to go? Yeah, and to me, it was the most innovative master's program that I'd seen. Um, I loved that it was so current. So when I looked at other master's programs, um, it was quite slow for them to change the curriculum and to get things through. And I loved that the master's program was so current. So um, they took around kind of almost every three months really reviewing the content. And I, I loved that because how can you do a futuristic master's if you're not keeping things current? Um, and I loved the human element. So um, tech with heart is kind of something that's quite um, uh, important to me. And the program really accentuates that for me and that it was very human centered. So um, it wasn't trying to put you into a box. It, they weren't trying to angle you to something that they wanted to see documented and have research papers attached with their name on. It was literally allowed you to really be yourself. And we had such an amazing cohort. I mean, I'm not just saying that because I'm on the call. Um, but such an amazing cohort of, you know, a really wide range of different skill sets. And I loved that it was mature um, students as well. Um, so, yeah, we had doctors and lawyers and um, all sorts of different people on our cohort. Um, and that just brought such a richness that I didn't see in other programs. For me, I came to this uh, project or the program um, for some other different reasons. I were I was on a lot of boards at the time, um, still am on, on a lot of boards, um, 
and I want to sort of upskill myself in terms of knowledge around uh, the future and technologies in particular. And so um, that's what first got me started in terms of looking at uh, courses. Uh, and uh, what appealed to me for the course was the project-based nature and the creativity in the in the uh, industries. I've always been interested in future technologies and and, and um, different types of technologies. Um, I was saying uh, in a previous meeting that I when I one of the first TV shows was a show called Cyberworld for Māori Television, and we interviewed probably about 150 different companies in New Zealand, all based in technologies in different ways and stuff. So it was always of interest of mine to be in this sort of area and study in this area. So that's what drew me to the course. Fantastic, thank you everyone. Um, and just to Melissa's point about those subject matter experts that we bring on board and Francis touched on as, as well, um, they really do bring that current knowledge um, into the sessions that they deliver. And it's more of a conversational style of learning and it's experiential learning and applied learning um, in play. And it's those conversations that you will have that will be so much valuable rather than you know the typical lecture style learning that you have at other organizations and then you bring that knowledge back and apply it directly to the project that you're you know you you're de developing as well so that's um a point of difference with our masters as well um and just moving on to the next question um the name of this master's program can seem a little misleading uh, could you talk about the sessions that are covered in the program and the expectations around you know applying that context to your context um, to your projects um, is it only about tech or does it encompass a broader view of the future similar to the content francis has just shared on this call as well uh, linda do you want to go first yeah sure so look i I came in, of course, being a little bit terrified about um, what it was going to be like and, and what, you know, my knowledge, I was concerned that I wasn't going to have that depth of knowledge. But it's actually about teaching you a framework in that you can actually build, build your knowledge and learn more about it. Um, I think that's probably the easiest way for me to explain how I thought, yeah. Melissa? Yeah, there was such a range of topics. I mean, I often describe to people, I'm a really passionate learner, and that first immersion phase for me was like being in a candy store of learning. Like you had these incredible different speakers speaking on such a range of things. So um, you might you might look at cybersecurity one day, but then you might be looking at agile frameworks the next day and doing mini sprints. You might be um, looking at personal development plans. You might have a lawyer and accountant talking about if you're starting your own startups and how to have those conversations. Um, creative things, you had cultural elements. There was such a range of things that literally fires every part of your brain. And I absolutely love that. And thank you, Bradley. One of the things I liked um, and appreciated with this course is that um, there's a lot of uh, Māori uh, kaupapa embedded within the course. Um, and there's a reason for that um, in terms of the future of New Zealand and, and the way New Zealand is panning out. And I, and I agree with that. And so I was quite surprised uh, about that when I came to the course and to see that embedded so well. Um, and, and I give a big up to Francis for that and the team for that because I think it's a really good way of, of learning. The other part of it is that with all the different experts that come in with all these different topics, it's not sort of a overwhelming as what I thought it would be. Um, they sort of take you sort of step by step through um, some of the basics and some of the importance of why we're looking at it, this, this particular topic and how it applies. And that's where you sort of get to I guess, uh, candy pick, um, like in a candy store, like Melissa was saying, uh, you know, some of the things that you might want to take for your particular project or some of the ideas that you might even apply to your home or to your family or to your business. Um, you can sort of hand pick some of those um, elements of those different technology, technologies and different learnings that we're learning all the time. And so that's a really, for me, a really rewarding way of learning um, because we're able to uh, grow within the program and, um, also extend outside of that because each of the experts becomes available to you. So you can then go and interact with them directly if you have a particular interest in something. So I had a little idea around some AI area. So I went to the person who was our tutor on AI and spoke to her directly about some of these things and got some things going there. So you can actually sort of follow it through as well in your interests. Fantastic, thank you so much, Bradley. And that's so true about you know building your network out and 
you know, embedding a deeper connection to the innovation and um, uh, entrepreneurship, you know, network available in New Zealand. And I was actually on a call with someone uh, completely new. It was an introduction about, you know, potentially doing a, a session around deep tech in, in the master's program. And she actually said halfway through, oh, um, she knows one of our advisors and she's actually spoken to one of our candidates in a, in a cohort already on agritech. So it's those connections and networks that you get to have and build um, that's a value add in the program as well. Um, and uh, the next question that I have, and it's related to that technology, emerging disruptive technology and how much that you need to know um, piece. How would you describe your level of technology know-how or expertise before starting the program? And how would you describe your understanding now? Bradley, shall we start with you this time? Yeah, I think I've learned quite a lot. I mean, I thought I knew a lot coming into this as well. Um, and um, it, it's been surprising just in terms of the, the, the width of knowledge that you have. But as I mentioned before, the advantages that you've got is you've got um, both uh, course notes and, and presentations and contacts so that you can take anything further. So if I go back in terms of just, I remember even just, just a thing on presenting, we had, a, we had a part of the courses on presenting and how you present and, and some skills in presenting. And I found that really valuable. I've done a lot of presenting in the past. I've seen a lot of presenters in my time. And, um, and, and yet the framework of that was really, really helpful. And I remember giving it to my kids for their classwork at school. You know? So I was passing knowledge down to my kids from knowledge I'd learned in this course. So I think that's the advantage is that you've got all these little pieces of knowledge that you can sort of go back to all the time and reference and use in different ways once you sort of think through different aspects of your life. Aztec and Melissa? Yeah, so, you know, I, I did have a technology degree, but I would say that's the quickest expiring degree you could probably do. Um, and, uh, you know, things change, but, but I think even if you know some of the components, what the Masters really did for me is it brought it all together and one conversation would layer onto another, which would layer onto another, which would layer onto another. And, you know, I loved the really rich discussions on things like the impact. So, you know, on the surface, yes, there's this technology, but then what industries might that disrupt? And then actually, what are, what are the layers under that that you might not even be considering are disrupting? And so I, I loved that wider conversation around the technology. So you might go in there knowing, saying, oh, yeah, I know that technology or I know that framework. But for me, it was the combination and being able to make those connections between all the different topics that was the rich layer. Yeah, absolutely agree with you, Melissa. I think that was something that we in our, in our cohort definitely had that ability to build on an idea and, and we just learned so much and it was the richness of the discussions was just so powerful. Um, look, I came into it with, you know, not as a little bit of knowledge um, and I just I've learned so much more and look I'll never be able to code myself but I certainly know what I'll need to look for when um, getting hiring someone to do coding for me but also it taught me how to actually how to go about researching tech things and to get a deeper understanding and, and that connections within the um, that you'll meet with the lecturers absolutely phenomenal and being able to talk to the experts in the field and you know talk about your project with them and get some really good feedback it's it's an incredible experience thank you um, did, did everyone answer that question oh fantastic um and just to add to that um one of the pathways into the master's program is um, yes academic and also there's a pathway that we um, call the equivalence pathway where you don't have to have a tertiary you know a bachelor's level um, degree uh, to get into the master's program we also look at you know your relevant experience in um, a, a technology space um, and so can you talk a little bit about um, you know for anyone who is a little bit nervous about tackling a master's without having done previous tertiary education, you know, what advice would you give to them? I'm happy to go with this because I, look, I've, I've done, um, I did a postgraduate diploma in personal financial planning in um, 2010. And it was very similar to my university days back in the 80s. I hate to admit that. Um, but it was, you know, the formula was rote learn the lectures, do the assignments and cross your fingers that it was, the, um, you know, the right questions in the exam. 
this master's is so much more revealing because you can't wing it. But that's because you actually don't want to wing it. You become so passionate about the purpose of your project because it's personal to you. You actually are deeply embedded in the outcomes. And it certainly does not feel like any other university learning that I've done. I don't think any person in our cohort just did the bare minimum to get the qualification. We're all, you know, all in. And I think the difference also I felt is that it was much, it was almost more of a family environment than when I'd done my first degree program and the support layer around this master's is phenomenal. I mean, you saw that um, wonderful slide with um, four of the key people that will be supporting the upcoming programs, but the team's incredible. Um, and, and so I think they helped every single person in the program who at varying stages had you know, nerves about what one element or another or was slightly out of their comfort zone on, you know, so whether it be around how to, how to write um, academically or write, do those um, references, Linda, <laughs> um, all, all of those sorts of things through, through, you know, from that stuff to people who are a bit nervous about speaking to people more nervous on the cultural element, whatever that was, there was always people to support. Um, and so I think that's something that's quite unique and special about this program. Yeah, I'd, I'd follow that up and, and support what Melissa's saying as well. I, I think that the um, team around the program is really supportive. Um, I had, it was a while since I'd been to university as well and to, to tech, um, to do anything. Um, and so uh, relearning uh, some of the academic rigours that they still have in place within this course was uh, not a challenge for me, but it was just a, a nicely reminded in terms of just how to go through that. Um, and there's always people there always supporting you all the time. So we have both people on the days that we come into the course, they're available through um, the different channels that we communicate with um, in terms of a Slack channel and things like that, which is main, mainly what we use. And then you've got individual emails for all these different people as well. So at any time, I felt really supported in terms of that whole uh, academic rigor that you have around a master's as well. Um, and and uh, the feedback from your um, uh, assessors and or your advisors, you have an advisor that's assigned to you, um, was really, really supportive. For me, it uh, was a challenge. Um, so once again, I came in there thinking I knew it all. <laughs> and um, I got challenged quite hard by my um, advisor, which was really refreshing because uh, not many people challenged me too much in my, in my work. Um, and so I had to sort of answer some of those questions and, and, and respond in, in the positive way that I, I have um, to get through it all. So it was really good. Fantastic. Thank you, Bradley. It's constructive nudges, right? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And um, to be honest, I must share that, um, you know, I graduated from Auckland Uni and the graduation ceremony, you're with a mass of people and then you walk across the stage and you get your certificate. But our graduation ceremonies, if, like the staff, we're in tears because we're celebrating that along with you. We've been on this journey with you and we're just so proud of, of everyone and what they've accomplished. And you become part of this lifelong, you know, network of people that you're, you know, so connected as well. So that's really special for me. Um, so I've been with the organization for a year now um, and just to witness that and just to see the difference and see it in play was very special as well. Right, and I know a lot of people are thinking about, oh, um, you know, it's a project-based master's. Do you have to come into the master's with the project in mind? I would encourage you not to, personally, um, because as particularly at that beginning where you have all of the different um, ideas coming through, it's that you start to, it opens up possibilities so that, you know, they talk about your reticular activating system of your brain. You know, if you're focused on one thing, you might block out some things. So I went in there with kind of a bit of an open mind and I started to form, really shape an idea as we had more and more sessions and it started to evolve. Um, that's my personal um, experience. Absolutely. Same with me. I didn't have a project in my mind, but it was the fun in trying to find it. I mean, I had a couple of moments of like, oh, what am I going to do? But it's amazing that you actually go on quite a journey of self-discovery and then you find a project that really connects with you and becomes, you know, it's, you become really passionate about it. But it, it, I agree with Melissa in that you're probably best if you don't have a project in mind because 
this ability to really think wider and deeper about what you want to achieve is it makes it a much more interesting project. Uh, I was the opposite. I came in with a, a strong project in mind um, and something I'd been working on for in some way for about 15 years. So, um, but what happened when I got into the course was I almost, what the famous word in, in our course is pivot. You know, you actually sort of pivot all the time from one idea to the other. Um, and if you're anything like me where you have multiple ideas, you're always wanting to pivot to other things that might interest you. So I almost pivoted twice uh, throughout my early stage of this, of this master's. Um, and then funny enough, I came back to the original idea that I went in with and, and rejuvenated that in a different, slightly different way. So um, I think keeping your um, mind open, if you do come on with a project, keeping your mind open to uh, some of the, um, the knowledge that you, that you learn would help in terms of um, just guiding you in terms of making some decisions in that way about a project. Great, thank you so much. Um, and the next question is, you know, what would you say to anyone thinking about studying now, especially, you know, in a world of COVID-19 and lockdowns, um, you know, has, I know Melissa and Linda, you would have been affected by the lockdowns um, last year as well. And Bradley, you know, you're currently um, doing the masters in that project phase. Um, is there any advice that you, you know, or any, 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 um, advice that you can give um, to relieve some of those anxieties about, you know, starting studying now? I wish I'd done it a lot earlier in my career. I have absolutely mm -hmm. loved it. I just think you just need to get on and do it. Um, sit down and discuss it with your family because you'll need them on board because you'll be, you'll be bouncing ideas off them all the time. Um, but also talk to your employer and honestly, if they can't see the value in you taking time up to invest in yourself, then I think you have to question, are you with the right employer? Um, I, you know, I would just, I can't sort of impress on anybody how much it sort of has changed so many things, um, not just with the degree, but, you know, just the whole way you approach thing. I came into the course with very sort of short-term thinking from a business world where it's sort of two to three year timeframes. And I've come out with sort of thinking in 30 year timeframes when, um, you know, setting strategies. So I don't think you should delay it. Um, and the thing is the whole world has moved to much more online and you can do it and can still get that same connection doing it online. Yeah, I think uh, technology has shown us that we, we have to have some resilience about how we work and stuff and how we think. Um, and um, I, I think the same with this course. There's so much value in this course. Uh, I was uh, talking to someone else. I said, oh, I've got 15-year-old daughters at high school. One of them wants to pull out of high school already. She's frustrated with the school system. I said, oh, if you could only do this course, it would be such a great idea to put you on, on this course at 15, you know, and see how you go. They'd struggle a lot because they haven't got the world view and, and the world knowledge, but um, they'd still do okay, you know. And so there's so much value in terms of the course, in terms of the learning and the opportunities. I think, um, like, uh, like Linda was saying, that you, I'd love to have done this 15, 20 years ago and see where my uh, career would have gone with the knowledge that I have now um, from this course. Um, actually, Mahesh, if I could just jump in. Um, so one of my roles I love is I have one-on-one -on -one sessions with current students and I had a number of students I had one-on-one -on -one with today. And we were talking about online and they were saying one of the best things about online, she was saying, actually, my husband sits right next to me every day on the sessions and he's learning just as much as I am. So we have a common conversation at night, which is such a lovely way that, you know, it wasn't just one person in class. He was working from home with her. And, you know, I think, you know, we, we're really relaxed about that kind of thing that actually a family get behind it. And actually it's a conversation that does go right into the family and the communities. It doesn't just stop with the individual student. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to add to that, Francis, in the last lockdown, and Bradley, this was your cohort that had to go online. There was a session on biotech and Craig Hilton, our national academic director, loves this topic and he has amazing slides about fluorescent mice and what have you. And we had so many kids join that Zoom call and just sit down and just, you know, um, they just really enjoyed learning about biotech on a Saturday. <laughs> um, Melissa, did you want to add to that? 
Yeah, I just think that we're in a pivotal part of history. And if you want to be part of shaping the future, get on board now. You don't want to be cohort 390. Come on, get on, get in there. We need, we need your help. And you don't want to, you don't want to sit and watch and go, what if? There, there are a number of people, so a little bit different. I actually stepped out of my career to do the master's and it was a real investment in myself to say, you know what, I just feel so strongly that this that this is so important and that I don't want to be on the sideline of a table conversation. I want to be in it and I want to be able to um, contribute to that. So I stepped out so that I could then step back in to, to support that. And I, I know a couple of peers um, at different organizations who were like kind of on the, on the edge of doing it. And every time I see them, they keep saying, I wish I'd done it when you'd done it. I wish I'd done it when you'd done it. So don't be cohort 390, just saying. Fantastic advice, Melissa. Um, and just uh, to wrap up, and I'm, I'm sure I'm mindful of time, um, but I know a lot of people who join these calls are anxious about, you know, work-life balance and study and how do you fit that in? What has been your experience in that? So with regards to work-life balance, I think it's best described as um, you almost find another gear um, when you're passionate about something, you just find the time. You know, I started getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning just because I'd wake up and my mind would start ticking over straight away and I'd just want to go and investigate. Um, I remember when I first came to one of these evenings, um, the GM at the time said, you know, it will feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. And it does really feel a bit like that at the beginning. But then you learn some tools to learn how to control the flow and you actually really enjoy the wealth of information out there. Um, so it is it is a balance but what what it does for you um you know it really does make you want to get up and and learn more it, it ignites that curiosity in you so i think you can balance it all and in fact i think the positive role modeling you do to other people about you know education isn't just something you do and then at the beginning you go to university and then you go and set up your career we should be learning every day. Love sour bread. Yeah, if you're if you're making the investment in yourself, you want to maximize it, right? So for me it was about about all in and I was just absolutely gonna gonna make this happen. So I still had a mortgage to pay. So um, you know, I was doing some side contract part-time things to 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 make things ends ends meet around it. Um, but yeah, it was about the focus of, I knew that this was an absolute luxury, precious time for me to be able to have the study opportunity um, and I was going to make it work. And it's not a, you know, it's not a six year program, you know, it's a, it's a short, punchy masters. That's the other thing I really liked about it. Um, and you absolutely can do it. And I bet, especially those of you that have got kids, I bet you invest a lot of time and support in their dreams. Um, just put a little bit of support in your own because it'll it'll pay off the other end. Yeah, I think I think Melissa's answer is really good. Um, investing in yourself um, and you know, by by investing in this in this uh, masters. Um, anyone that knows what I do, go wow. You know, in terms of like the, the amount of work I'm doing, two TV shows, two animations at the moment. I'm doing a music video. I'm managing a band. I'm managing and coaching a netball team. I'm uh, on about seven different boards. And then I have my own business, my wife's business that we run as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm stretched all the time. Um, and uh, I have a lot to do with my two daughters as well in terms of their, their work and their schooling and stuff. So I, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd advise people is, is that you do learn some skills within this course as well about how to manage those kind of things and how to plan and how to do things a little bit better in terms of, um, you know, uh, looking at uh, different ideas and, and models to actually plan and, and work through the masters. Um, and that support network around the people that uh, are helping you is really, really strong. But you do have to really commit to it. Um, the, in saying that, we had one of our um, cohorts in our, in, our, um, in our gen who had some um, personal issues, and, and he's been supported basically with Tech Futures to just drop back a little bit and take it another step again and go through the next cohort. So he's, he's now with cohort uh, 14 as opposed to 13, and he's been supported in that way too. So when those tough times come, you are supported really, really well by um, Tech Futures, and that's really rewarding to see. But that's yeah, be committed to it, definitely. 
Yeah, and I agree with Linda. Talk to your family before, or you know, your, your the people around you, your support network. Um, I'm I'm sure they'll back you. But you know, I, w I was very lucky. My husband was super supportive, um, and knew knew what was involved, and um, that that definitely helped. So um, yeah, get people to rally around you a little bit. Can I just also just jump back in again, um, because I know we're going to close off soon. I think we we heard Melissa what you were doing when you started, and likewise Linda. Um, I know Brad, you're still studying and, you're, and you've got a million things on, but Melissa and Linda, you're, both your jobs have changed. Um, maybe you could just comment about how they changed and the role you're in now, would it have, would it have been a role you would have either applied for or, or have got prior to the master's? So maybe Melissa, if you wouldn't mind starting. Yeah, so I'm in a unicorn role, uh, to, be, to be honest. In fact, I wrote down a kind of a affirmation of what I wanted a role to look like and ta-da, um, that's the role that I'm working in. So. Uh, the role and the role was almost designed. If you look at the um, job description for it, it's a mixture of background of people and a background of technology and that merge of it, which I'd never seen a job ever that that allowed me. So normally you have to work. I'd have to work in the people division or I'd have to work in the technology division. I have a job where I work across both of those, um, which is phenomenal, and that is largely attributed to me doing this this masters. Absolutely. Can you say what it is? Oh, so sorry. Yeah, I'm the um, GM of Future Work at um, Victor. Um, and in fact, they literally contacted me the day that I finished my master's. So, um, and they'd been stalking me slightly before then. But um, yeah, the master's program definitely made a difference. And for me, um, I'd always been um, pretty much in that ultra high net worth end of the market. And um, looking after personal financial planning. And this, the uh, masters gave me the courage to really step out of my um, comfort zone and challenge me to transfer my skills across to an unfamiliar field. And I absolutely loved it. So I've been gone into running a team of business bankers because I wanted to learn about running a small business and there's no better way than to see um, 800 businesses in action. Um, but the other thing that I think the masters um, proved to my employer that I was worth investing in further as well. And I've just been put on a sponsorship program that usually they wouldn't even look at, um, you know, somebody of my age. I, I didn't feel they would look at them, somebody of my age, because it showed that I was cared enough about my career and the fact that my career could last another 20 years, I hope, because uh, I love it so much. And that I'd invested in that, and then that was worth them investing in my next career move as well. Thank you so much. Fantastic. And just to answer that question about pathways into the PhD, um, even though we haven't yet managed to wrangle um, Francis or Twister um, about having a PhD within Tech Futures Lab, there's certainly a pathway that we can map out for you individually, depending on your project um, and with the institution that you want to do your PhD in. Um, but just flag that with us quite early on, and then we can make sure that your project aligns to those goals that you have as well. Was there any other questions to the panel, Amanda, coming through from the chat? Just on that PhD, uh, Maheshi, I mean, I've enjoyed Tech Future so much that I'm actually looking at doing a PhD now. Um, and um, the way I'm looking at approaching that is that uh, University of Auckland have a, um, a creative practice component to a PhD, which is sort of a little bit similar to this in that it's a, it can be a project-based uh, PhD. Um, so I'm sort of looking seriously at that um, and pathwaying from this straight into that, much to the horror of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, gosh, more amazing. study. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Maheshi, we have um, a couple of people who are interested in um, if we cover off artificial intelligence and machine learning um, and analytics. So if um, anyone was able to touch on that and what was covered in the program. Definitely. And Francis, do you mind taking the lead on this question? Because you know Master quite well as well. <laughs> Look, we, they are all areas which are key and, and, and critical in, in the studies. And we have specialists in all these areas. And so data is actually at the heart of everything. There's really no part of business today that, so AI and machine learning is really only there to be able to, to collect and analyze data. And so 
if you think about uh, whatever you're doing right now, if you're making good business decisions, you need good data and you need, need to know how to analyze it. So how you get that, whether you've got sensors or you've got people followed, you know, collecting data from someone's Bluetooth movements, whatever it might be, you really, it is at the heart of it. So, um, and we do have specialists in all these areas. So I think the key thing is, and while they, they are all part of it, if something tomorrow, for example, if CRISPR gene editing became a really big thing in New Zealand tomorrow, or or the space industry took off even more than it is, no pun intended, we would then bring those components in as well. You know, we're, we're moving with demand in, in areas. And if we saw that New Zealand wasn't really adopting one particular area, we wouldn't be really focused on things which were not as contextualized within the, the current New Zealand market, but also in, in the opportunities that are here. Um, so, you know, we are, we, you know, we, we and, and to all this time, we haven't taken international students. It has been designed for, for Kiwis in all the colors and shapes and sizes that we, we come, because we think it's a really important that the New Zealand economy benefits from the knowledge that we develop here. And it's been a real commitment to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that we need smart people and we need smart people to keep learning. So that's a real passion of mine. Thanks. And I had a question from Aaron earlier that I wanted to flesh out a little bit more about the project phase. Is it a product product design and implementation or can you just develop a, a concept? Um, I can take the lead on that. Um, and it's definitely um, the world is sort of your oyster in this master's and the goals that you have for yourself is dependent on um, yeah, what you want to achieve at the end of it. Um, so yes, some people have walked away with working prototypes. Um, some people have walked away with, you know, fully formed businesses because they've aligned it with, um, you know, other goals that they've had for themselves and other funding, you know, sources. Um, and please feel free to check out our content hub on the website, which um, has some case study examples and interviews from um, our past, you know, alumni to show you the range of outcomes that is possible um, in the master's program. So yes, you can walk away with a minimal working viable product, um, but you can also walk away with a concept then then you'll take on to the real world and implement as well. But did anyone in the panel just want to add to that? I just think it's fantastic the journey you go on. If somebody had told me on day one that I'd start off, um, that I would finish it, um, my master's by having a YouTube channel with giving personalized financial advice to millennials, I would have said, that's crazy. But it's it's the amazing way it takes, the journey takes you. And it meant um, that you could, you know, I did do a prototype as well of, of um, a, a way of giving financial advice to millennials in a much more low cost model. And it's it's the knowledge of, and the experimentation and that takes you on all sorts of directions and it's just so powerful. But I think the other part of it is that you leave a legacy that somebody that's following behind you can actually pick up where you've left off with the knowledge and experience that you've got and take it to the next level. Yeah, I, I definitely ended up doing a load of different things that were unexpected. So I, I ran a hackathon during my, my master's, which was a project within the project. And I also um, ended up with a, with a bit of a prototype that looks like it could evolve into developing a product, which blew my mind. That was not, a, not something I expected. Um, that's taking me on another journey now. So, um, yeah, who knows what 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 could what could come out? What doors could open? What avenues could come come out of this program? Uh, with my project, um, I'm into the the last phase, which is the second phase of, of actually building something, and um, we're actually looking at a test site. Um, what I'm creating is a, um, a language learning uh, delivery for um accelerated learning of a language and uh looking at maori language and then looking at dialects of maori language so um it's a real product i've got people who are wanting to fund it their front and center um through the work they're already doing um and uh we're working on having a full prototype website built before christmas so um i'm pretty active in that space investing it in myself um with with some other people that are supporting me in that um but yeah um it doesn't have to be like that it can be just an idea that you're sort of developing further. Um, but yeah, the program sort of is up to you really.
Cool, thank you everyone. And I thought I'd just open up the floor to the audience if there's any questions that um, you haven't popped in the chat, you're most welcome to unmute yourself and pose your question forward. I know you're going to close off in a moment, Amanda, but I just wanted to say, on, um, for me, on behalf of you know, just the fact you've taken an evening out to to join, I want to thank the panelists personally, who I, you know, people, three fabulous people who I adore deeply and, and, and um, really respect. So thank you for taking your time. But for those who are here, even the fact you're looking and thinking about doing something different, I encourage you to keep doing that, whether it's this program or just being bold and, and, and stepping into the unknown. It's a good time. And... You know, I think one of the most amazing things about being human is we can keep reinventing ourselves and we can change the situation we're in if we want to make an impact and, and, and do things differently. So thanks everyone. So just kakite anō from me. Thank you, Francis. And it's so good to see so many people here to listen to us all share the great value that um, you've got out of the program and that the purpose that we're trying to help you all to guide you on your journeys and creating that impactful future for yourself and for our country too. So thank you. I'm just going to quickly, if there aren't any more questions, um, I'm going to share my screen again and just cover off a few uh, closing points. One moment. It was an outstanding question from Aaron in the chat there, Amanda. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so thank you, Aaron. Is there a Māori Pacific support team for Māori Pacific students for culture advice um, and support? So Mahishi, maybe you wanted to cover that off. Yeah, absolutely. And that support team um, is called uh, Manaki Tono Group that is very specific to uh, Māori and Pacifica students. We also have, um, and Amanda's going to touch on this uh, in her next slide as well, um, uh, financial support in the um, sense of scholarships available to these to cultural groups as well. Um, but yes, there's, there's definitely built in support as an organization uh, for Maori and Pacific students. Can I just um, ask a question? I haven't got my, um, my picture up there because I couldn't get out, but um, I'm one of those people that I just was so keen to hear about this and learn about this because I love learning and I'm, I'm not really serious about doing a program, but just really loved hearing the whole presentation and, and what you've all got out of it. But if I had any further questions, would we be able to talk to any of the panelists? Um, yeah, absolutely. You can reach out to, um, I see Bradley's just put it on the chat as well, but you're welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, because I've, I've talked to a large number of people about my, my journey and yeah, I'm really keen to talk to anybody who wants um, some, you know, more um, just discussion around it. Fabulous. And I see Melissa's just put in the chat as well. Um, yeah. She's open for it too, yeah. Yeah, I love speaking to proactive people, so absolutely. Cool. And you're most welcome, Bradley. Sorry. Yeah, one of the things that I think um, we sort of alluded to a little bit, but hasn't haven't really, really reinforced, is that um, the connections that you make within the course are really, really big. And um, some of the inquiry from other students that you're with really sort of elevates this whole course another level because you know they're asking questions and they don't they're not afraid to ask questions, which is really interesting. You know, people just get up and do stuff and get it. They're, they're all doers. You know, the people that are attracted to this course are real doers. And so they're getting up and asking questions all the time. So the cohort that you're in and, and the relationships that you make both with your presenters and, and, um, and, and your fellow students is really, really strong. Um, and you get a lot of value out of that. So I'm happy to support anyone going forward. Thank you all. And you're most welcome um, to reach out to me as well. And um, I can have a conversation with you to understand and your area, your context that you're interested in, and we can possibly find um, an alumni, a group of alumni that is relevant to your context, and you can have a conversation there on what they got out of the program too. So I'm just gonna quickly touch on the last things before we close off. Share my screen. So, 
so the next steps after tonight, um, if you haven't already looked look over our program handbook. So I've got, uh, you'll receive this information after the info session. We'll send you out an email tomorrow morning with these links to the handbooks if you haven't looked already. Um, have a look at our master's website. And if you're really keen, I know a couple of you are, um, you can submit your application to start in our master's program um, in our upcoming October intake. So that's starting on the 28th of October. Uh, also have a look at some of our student success stories on our content hub, as Mahesh mentioned earlier, some blogs and podcasts and some industry insights um, and areas of interest that could be relevant to you. And if you haven't already, reach out to me and have a conversation so I can understand a little bit more about your goals and aspirations, where you're wanting to head to, as well as lining you up with any other alumni, um, getting to know more about the program and if it will work for you too. You can talk to your employer and I can provide you with a letter of support to get uh, to help you with any um, time or financial assistance, as well as reviewing your financial options. So whether your workplace is happy to support you financially on your studies, either um, or choosing a student loan and there are scholarships available if you identify as Māori or Pacifica as well. And just quickly to add to that to Amanda, um, just with submitting your application, we do have a 10% early bird discount available if you submit your application four weeks before the intake start date. So if you're considering the October intake or any of the future intakes um, advertised uh, for 2022, get that application in. It just draws that line in the sand and guarantees you the 10% discount but you don't have an obligation to see your application through if the intake doesn't work out for you. So it's always good to get your applications through, have those chats with us, and we'll help you figure out whether this is the right fit for you. Uh, but we don't want you to miss out on that 10% early bird discount as well. Thanks, Maheshi. Um, so there are my contact details as well if you'd like to reach out and have a chat. It'd be great to get to know um, where you're going. And I'd like to close off our evening tonight um, with the great discussions that we've had here to go, send you back out into your, your homes or your lounges and off back into your everyday life. So I'll close off now. Ka whakairia te tapu, kia wātia ai te ara, kia turuki whakatai, kia turuki whakatai, haumie, huie, taiki. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Kia ora, Bradley, Melissa, Linda, Francis, everyone for joining. This will, has been recorded, so Nothing. I will share this with you all. Uh, have a lovely rest of your night, and thanks. To, uh, great to see so many of you here tonight. Ka kite. Bye. 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 Bye.